You gotta move. You gotta move. You gotta move, child. You gotta move. Cause when the Lord gets ready, you gotta move. You may be black, you may be white, you may be wrong, you may be white, <laughs> but when the Lord gets ready, you gotta move. Play that thing, play that thing, man. Come on, yeah, 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 yeah. You gotta move. St. Paul's most prominent citizens. Perhaps you've seen our morning paper. William T. Francis, prominent St. Paul attorney, William T. Francis, age 60, will be laid rest today following a funeral and reception at Pilgrim Baptist Church in St. Paul. Death was caused by yellow fever, contracted while Mr. Francis was serving our country as ambassador to Liberia only the second Negro to hold such a high office in American history. Mr. Francis came to St. Paul from Indiana in 1887 when he began his professional path as a messenger for the Northern Pacific Railroad. By 1904, Mr. Francis had advanced to the position of chief clerk in the legal department where he continued to serve as an attorney following his graduation from St. Paul College of Law in 1904. In 1912, Mr. Francis inherited the private legal practice of renowned colored attorney Frederick McGee, which he successfully continued until his appointment to federal service. In addition to his prominent position in local and social circles, Mr. Francis was also active in national organizations, including the Republican National Party, which he served as a chair of the color division in 1924, thereby contributing to the election of President Calvin Coolidge. Mr. Francis is survived by his wife of 36 years, Mrs. Nellie Griswold Francis. The service at Pilgrim Baptist Church will be presided over by Pastor L.W. Harris, and internment will be in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, quiet now, Pastor Harris is about to speak. Let's get a little of some glory this glory. morning. Yes, glory, yes, glory. yes, yes. Ah, mm. mm. oh, brother. William T. Francis was what you call a man's man. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, he was. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Sure was. And that's because he was God's man. Yes. A man ordained and appointed by God yes. Mm -hmm. yes. to lead his yes. people along the right path. Come on now, come Praise on. Praise the Lord. And that's a path that was ordained and appointed by God. That's right. Yes, yes right. he was. Brother Francis didn't shrink back from his purpose. No. You know he didn't. No, not my bill. Mm -hmm. And that purpose was to be an example for every colored man. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. right. And, and every white man, too. Mm -hmm. Brother Francis showed yeah. everyone what a brown man could do. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. No. Right. And, and not just a, a, a 
a janitor or or, or a butler or a train porter. Well. And and y'all know I'm I'm not saying those are bad jobs. If that's what you're doing for a living, you're doing good for a colored man. Yes. That's right. Yes, yeah. you that's are. Right. Yes, that's you right. are. Yes, for a colored man. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But see, Brother Francis showed us that we could be more than just yeah, he uh, did. He did. Uh, farm hands or, or street sweepers. All right. That right. we could be uh, a teacher. Mm -hmm. Yes. That yeah. we could be uh, an attorney. That's a right. Good yeah. attorney. Yes. That's good right. attorney. That's right. <laughs> that we could be even doctors. Yes, That's right. Praise the right. Lord. And that God the Lord. would give us favor along the way. Favor. Yes. 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 Like, like he gave Brother Francis favor mm -hmm. to become. U.S. Ambassador to Liberia. My, my, my. Oh, give him glory. <laughs> yeah. Somebody give the Lord glory. God is good. That's right. Yes, sir. And though, and though the yellow fever may have taken him from us. Well, mm -hmm. well. Brother Francis made his mark in this world. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's all right, brother. And now he's making his mark up in heaven with our yes. Father God. Yes, yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, yes, yes. yes, he is. yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Brother Francis carried a staff for his people, uh -huh. like most. All right, all right, all right. Mighty banner. Preach, preach. Showing us the way to yes, the sir. promised yes, land. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. yes. And he wasn't afraid either. No. Nope. Not afraid. No, Not he afraid. wasn't afraid. I myself watched Brother Francis mm -hmm. stand in the face of opposition mm -hmm. from the devil. Yes, yes. My God was his strength. Glory, yes. glory, glory. God glory. Was his strength. Yes. That's right. Brother Francis stood in the face of two. Yes. Huh? Y'all hear me? Two, two cross burning yeah. and yeah. never yes, even flinched. Stood like Mate Shadrach, Mate Shack, and Abednego <laughs> before the fire of Burke. Say it, say it. Preach the word, preach the word. And never strayed yes. from his purpose. That's right. Oh, y'all don't hear me. Oh, yes, sir. We with you, we with you, Pastor. I said it never wavered. Yes. Mm -mm. yes, he did. Yes, he did. Stood strong in the face of adversity. Yes, mm. yes. 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 Courage. Courage. And like Moses, he showed us the way to the promised land. Yes, he did. To, to hold jobs and yeah. to come on, come own on. home. Come on, yeah. say it. And to stand it. Uh -huh. equal to any man in this yeah. world. Tell oh. it. Yes, tell it. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And he was a, an example to our youngins, too. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. Y'all remember yeah. how he taught every one of them who would listen uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. the uh -huh. value. Uh -huh. Of, of self-respect yes, right. and of determination uh -huh. yes. and diligence, diligence. Yes. and yes. hard work if you yes. want to make your success yes. in this here world. That's right. Oh, yeah. That's yes, right. He did. Preach, yeah. preach yes, out. He did. Yes. Oh, come on, y'all. Y'all yeah. uh, getting right. kind of quiet praise on me over here. Praise the Lord. You know, praise the Lord. yeah, he was just as much, he talked just as much to y'all kids as he did to mine. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Praise yes, he did. did. Oh, but the Lord did give Brother Francis favor. Mm. Favor that included marrying a beautiful, talented, mm. y'all heard her sing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Credentialed Negro woman, yes, yes, Nellie yes. Francis. Yes, Nellie. Brother William blessed Nellie, yes, and Nellie did. blessed him right oh, back yes. through their whole mm. lives together. My, my, my. Nellie, God blessed y'all with wonderful, happy, yes. successful lives. Mm -hmm. and, and though you had no children, you know the Lord blessed you in a multitude of other yes, ways. Yes, He's a yes, good God. Yes, Lives yes. lived in the fullness of him. Mm. Yes. Yes, yes. So when you look back on these days, your, your, your time with William, mm -hmm. don't have no regrets. No. Don't no. let anybody sell you no, no regrets. Mm. Mm. No, just look back and thank the Lord. Thank yes. the Lord. Just say, thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank, thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Just say, thank you, Lord. Somebody sing with me. Thank you, Lord. Everybody ought to sing. Thank you, Lord. Well, I just want to thank you, Lord. Because you've been so good to me. You've been so good each and every day. Oh, you've been. It was a wonderful service, and 
Brother William would have been gratified at the response of all your friends. Mm. Yes, Pastor, you delivered a warm and eloquent eulogy for my Billy. All in all, it was a very nice service. Well, Brother William was a great man, mm. a dis distinguished in his own right. And I'm afraid that my meager words could never convey what he meant to all of us. Brother William was an example to everyone and a, a beacon, especially to, to colored men and boys. Mm. And Nellie, you and William, well, you made quite a wonderful couple. Well, that was nice of the city council to offer that tribute to him. Yes, I'm proud of all the accomplishments that Billy and I made together. We, we were sure good together. I mean, 30, 36 years. <laughs> so I understand that you'll be taking uh, Brother William to uh, Tennessee, is it? Yes. Day after tomorrow. Yes, Nellie and I are taking Billy to Nashville on the train. As much as Billy enjoyed clerking for the NP, he certainly would have enjoyed the train rides to Nashville. My Billy had a fondness for trains. We're, we're going to need to transfer in Chicago. Well, Nella, you, you try to get some rest now, because uh, we sure wouldn't want to see you overwhelmed due to exhaustion because oh, of all of this. Don't worry. I'll keep a good eye on him. Hmm. Sister Nellie, it may be too early to consider, but will you be returning to St. Paul anytime soon? No, no, Valdo. I feel as if I'm leaving St. Paul for the last time. Hmm. You see, my grandmother is ill. And I feel it should be me who cares for her. She's, she's 100 years old. Oh Indeed, a blessing. Yes. Well, our community will certainly miss your leadership and involvement. And we will oh, yeah. down, undoubtedly down at the NAACP miss your input. You and Bill have been an integral part to the impact that that organization has had here in the Twin Cities. You're right, Waldo. Founding members like Nellie are really hard to replace. Well, Judge, you and Waldo have been quite wonderful leaders yourselves. I mean, Billy and I were always hopeful that St. Paul would be uh, uh, racial equity for all. And I'm sure there are many who will help you with that cause. Well, Nellie, I'll try to see you before I leave. But tell me, have you had a good cry? I did all my crying on the trip over from Monrovia. I think I'll spend much of the rest of my time contemplating all the accomplishments that Billy and I made right here in St. Paul. Yes, Nellie, you and Bill certainly served our community well. Why, the NAACP is proud to note that it was Bill who stopped the police from detaining black women uh, unconditionally in jail. And he fought discrimination oh, yeah. on a number of fronts. But Nellie, it was you, oh, yes. it was yeah. you, Nellie, that got the anti-lynching bill in that. <laughs> oh, yes. It wasn't easy. I mean, Billy and I had our own personal challenges. Why, with all of those prejudiced white folk Ooh. in the Groveland area. The house. The threats, the demonstrations. You cross burners. All because of the house. Judge, Baldo, thank you for being there for us. Indeed, it was a challenge for us all, but we prevailed and I am proud to say that the two of you will always be my friends. 
Oh, they didn't know who they were going up against, did they, darling? Mm. You <laughs> and Billy were formidable opposition. <laughs> All of our experience with the suffragettes and the anti-lynching law made us more than prepared for the muley grievances of some prejudiced white folk. Yeah. Oscar Anderson, of all oh. people, leading the way, oh. chief clerk of the state house. Apparently, our political notoriety didn't mean much to him. I mean, with our moves staring him in the face. Why, I remember where it all began. Billy had come in from work and said that he had a surprise visit from Arneson and his Improvement Association. Mr. Arneson, Mr. Haas, and Mr. Greer are here for their 2 p.m. appointment, Mr. Francis. Shall I show them in? Thank you, Barbara. Yes, right away, please. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm Bill Francis. Well, good afternoon. I'm Oscar Arneson, Wally Greer, and Quincy Haas. Nice, nice to meet you. you. Any of you gentlemen like a cup of coffee? No, thank no. you. No, no, thank you. All right. Well, please, please be seated, gentlemen. <clears throat> and to what do I owe this visit? Mr. Arneson advised us that you all have a legal issue to discuss with me, but he didn't offer any details. And I must say, it's quite unusual for me to meet three new clients at the same time, so I am curious about your issue. Well, we're not really here to request your legal services. Um, rather, we have a more personal issue to discuss. A personal issue? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> well, we, we understand that you and Mrs. Francis are in the process of buying a home on Sargent Avenue. Yes, that's true. Well, that's what we wish to discuss with you. All right, go ahead. Um, is there something wrong with the place where you've been living? Your home down there in St. Anthony? No, not at all. We've been living in that home for a number of years now, and Mrs. Francis has decided that she wants a new one. Is there anything wrong with that? You're all married men, aren't you? You certainly understand. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Francis, <clears throat> we all live on the 2100 block of Berkeley Avenue, just two blocks south of Sargent, and we are, well, just wondering why you are trying to move into our neighborhood. Well, Mr. Haas, I'm not sure why that is any of your concern, but the fact is that for some time now, Mrs. Francis has wanted to live in a much newer home than our St. Anthony residence. She actually picked out one over on James Avenue, but the seller of that house, by the way, a very nice man by the name of George Olson, well, he had just sold the house. Then Mr. Olson showed Mrs. Francis the Sargent home, which he had recently built, and she was very impressed with that house also. And as you know, it's in a neighborhood of new homes, which is exactly what Mrs. Francis was looking for. So, after I saw the house and we lined up some help on financing it, we decided to buy. Oh, I know Olson. Yeah, he's a good man and a good builder. I'll bet he could find another house for you. Maybe even be the builder. But, Mr. Arneson, Mrs. Francis and I are very happy with the house on Sargent. Why would we want to ask Mr. Olson about another house? Maybe we're not making ourselves clear, Mr. Francis. There are a lot of people in Groveland Park, not just us, who don't want you and Mrs. Francis to move into that house. We're just here as representatives of that group. Oh, I'm surprised, Mr. Arneson. What could anyone have against Mrs. Francis and me? Don't tell me that you men are still upset about that constitutional amendment Mrs. Francis pushed through. That women's suffrage deal? Come on, Francis. You know what we're talking about. We just bought homes in the neighborhood ourselves, and we don't want any coloreds moving in to wreck it for us. We're not against you and Mrs. Francis personally. It's just that uh, if you move in, the rest of the Rondo neighborhood will follow you over there, and then all our investments will be lost. Oh, come on now, Mr. Arneson. 
What makes you think that we or any other good, decent citizen who can afford a home in Groveland Park would do any harm to your precious neighborhood? Maybe you don't pay attention to what goes on in other cities, Mr. Francis, but we do. When coloreds start moving into a white neighborhood, the whites start moving out. Pretty soon a panic sets in and the houses become worth next to nothing. That's what has everyone up in arms, and I mean everyone. Yeah, we've been in touch with hundreds of people in the neighborhood already, and they all feel the same. <laughs> Gentlemen, you really disappoint me. You know, colored people have come to expect this kind of ignorance and prejudice in the South, and now even in some large northern cities, but we have been much more hopeful about our neighborhood here in St. Paul. And let me say, I believe that your fears are truly baseless. How can you say that? Certainly you colored folks have been reading about the racial problems all over America. And that NAACP organization is just making things worse, not better. Mr. Hobbs. Do you have any idea just how few colored people live in St. Paul? There must be plenty. I've driven through that Rondo area a few times and all I see are coloreds. Let me help you out. I did a little research on the 1920 census for a speech I gave. And in that year, just four years ago, the total Negro population in St. Paul was about 3,400 in a city of over 230,000. That's about 1.4% of the population. Now you think about that. You could line up 100 randomly selected St. Paul residents along Sargent Avenue, and one or maybe two would be colored. Surely, that could hardly affect any neighborhood. And that assumes that all the folks in the Rondo neighborhood would want to move to Sargent Avenue. The numbers don't matter, Francis. It's what people believe is what matters. And right now, people believe that one colored family will bring a dozen, maybe hundreds more with them. Gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. Do you know that right on Grand Avenue, near McAllister College, a colored man and his son have had a barber shop, and the father has had his home, and there hasn't been any problems at all. That area is no different than Groveland Park. Actually, that colored barber is part of our problem. The son you speak of, Ernest Starks, recently opened his own shop on St. Clair, near Cleveland. Well, that's within a stone's throw of, of our homes on Berkeley and the Sargent Avenue home you would like to occupy. The next thing you know, he'll be wanting to buy a home nearby. The way we see it, this is the beginning of a mass migration, and we mean to stop it. Hmm. Gentlemen? I'm afraid we're just going to have to agree to disagree. And I am very confident that none of your fears will ever be realized and you will find us to be very good neighbors. I'm sure the same will be true with respect to Mr. Stark. Francis, this could get very ugly if you fight us on this. Do us a favor. Go home and speak with your wife about this. Our women don't want any trouble in the neighborhood. And I don't think that your woman does either. Well, Mr. Greer, you can be certain that I'll tell Mrs. Francis about our little neighborly chat we've been having. But if you think that's going to change anything, well, you don't know much about Nellie Francis. Well, but you will talk to her and let her know the feelings in Groveland Park, won't you, Mr. Francis? Yes, I'll do that. And now, gentlemen, I have to prepare for a court hearing this afternoon, so I will thank you for your visit and wish you a good day. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> good evening, good evening. <laughs> good evening. I just want to welcome you to the special gathering of the Groveland Park Improvement Association. Yes, we're right. right. at Groveland Park Elementary. All right. <laughs> it's just great to see such a 
nice turnout of, yeah. of good folks yeah. who simply want to preserve our wonderful way of that's life. All yeah. that's, that's all we want. Uh, there must be 75 of us here tonight, and, yeah. that's, and that's right. just a fraction of the 300 people who signed our petition. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. This yeah. is grassroots yeah. democracy at its <laughs> best. Come on, Oscar. We know why we're here. Let's get on with that. Yeah. We don't want any niggers in our neighborhood. Oh, no, 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 slow down a minute, boys. Uh, we have a reporter from the dispatch here with us tonight, so let's make sure we get our story straight. <laughs> We're not here to call anybody names, Wally. We're simply here to talk about the property values in our neighborhood okay. and how to okay. keep them from collapsing. That's right. That's right, Oscar. Just explain the problem. Thank you, Mrs. Haas. I appreciate that. Now, as most of you know, a colored gentleman, or William Francis, and his wife have recently made arrangements to buy a home in this area. It's a very new home at 2092 Sargent's <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> I don't think anyone here has anything against Mr. Francis. Uh, he's a lawyer in downtown St. Paul, uh, a rather light-skinned Negro, and, and from all we know, generally well-behaved. But the fact remains, the undeniable biological fact he is colored, yeah. mm -hmm. as is Mrs. Frank. Oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> now, as most of you know, uh, the colored people in St. Paul have their own neighborhood, yes. sometimes yes. referred to as Rondo. Oh, yeah. It's the area yeah. east of Lexington yeah. Avenue, down from Central High School. Oops. It's a very nice neighborhood, mm -hmm. and exactly where the colored folks want to That's live. They want and they've got their own churches, mm -hmm. they've got their own stores. Mm -hmm. They have their own right way of life. And that is where they need to stay. Yeah, That's right. I think we can all agree with that, yeah. Molly. That's exactly why we're here tonight. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I don't know why, but for some reason, the Francis's have decided to sell the very new home on St. Anthony down around Dale and buy a home here in Groveland Park where none of their kind live. I'll no tell you here. why. It's because those colored women, they're uppity. I know. I see them at Woolworths all the time. I do, too. That may be, Mrs. Greer, but we have nothing against Mrs. Francis or against Mr. Francis, except if they were to move into that home on Sargent, well, we all know what would happen after that. Yeah, it would be like that influenza a few years ago. The germs come around and everybody gets sick. It's just like the plague. Well, I'm not sure everyone would get die, Wally, but uh, we sure would be hurt. A one colored family moving into the neighborhood, it, it's like the camel's nose coming into the tent. Yeah. And it doesn't take much imagination to know what happens to the tent after that. <laughs> That's right. exactly right, Oscar. One colored family moving into the neighborhood would be followed by another. Then prices well. would collapse as our good neighbors sell off, trying to avoid the flood. Then pretty soon our homes, our life's investments, oh. would be worth next to nothing. We're yeah. for that. Oh my God. Okay, Oscar, you're the smart businessman. What are we gonna do about this? Come on, yeah. well, that's, that's what we're here to decide, Mrs. Haas. Now, a few of us have already been down to Francis's office to tell him about our concerns. Twice, as a matter of fact. But so far, he's been pretty stubborn. He claims that a few colored folks in the neighborhood, a people of high quality like him, won't affect our property values at all. Well, we told him that's not the lesson of history. That's right, folks. That's right. You give those people an inch, and they will take a mile. Yeah. Yes, Our will. committee believes the time has come for action. Sure. Okay. Yes, we so can't fine. do it alone. No, no. we can't. <clears throat> We've been talking to some people around the country, and we believe that a few demonstrations in the neighborhood would be enough to change his colored yeah. folks' minds. Demonstrations? What kind of demonstrations are you talking about, Oscar? Well, I don't think it would really take much. Uh, probably just a nice parade down Sargent Avenue, you know, with uh, signs and banners and horns and firecrackers. Mm -hmm. Just enough so the Francis's understand just how unwelcome they would be if they were to try to move in. I think that would be enough to do the trick. Oscar, we're with you, but they haven't moved in yet. It'd be better for us to do our parade down by their house in Rondo. Yeah. Excellent. I don't think that would be too safe. I'm not sure we could get our whole crowd together for that. Quincy and I have been talking, and we think we could go right over to the, the house on Sargent Avenue tonight and deliver our message to the seller, a guy by the name of George Olson. 
uh, he should be able to pass the word on, and he might even be able to back out of the deal. Do you mean tonight? Yes, a few of us are ready to go right now. Hey. Quincy has prepared a few signs, and Wally has pulled together some of his horns and fireworks from his 4th of July party from last summer. That's right, folks. I bought those things to celebrate our freedom from the English, and now we're going to use them to keep us safe from the knee. The Negroes. <laughs> well, folks, are you with us? Yes! yes. Well, <clears throat> I believe that... Uh, that we can uh, go over uh, tonight. I don't think it will take very long. The house is just uh, a block from here, and then everybody can be home before there's any trouble. Okay. I've already spoken to a friend of mine in the police department, and he said he didn't okay. think this would be any kind of problem. Are you all with us? Yes. Yes. Oscar, now, we wouldn't be hurting anyone, would we? <laughs> No, no, not at all. Ed. We'd just be delivering a friendly, neighborly message. <laughs> hey, Oscar, what about that colored barber, Starks? Yeah. With a new shop on St. Clair, right across from the school here. Yeah. He's just another camel's nose in the tent. Yes, he is. Yes. Well, Starks doesn't live in our area, but, but you're right, Wally. He is part of the problem. <laughs> He's probably not around tonight, but uh, I, I'm sure that we can figure out a way to get our message to him. You know, we can do that. Good. Quincy. Uh, why don't we leave the Starks problem in your hands? Sure thing, Oscar. I've already had some thoughts about that. Wally, mm. we'll talk later about Starks. OK, folks, I think we have enough of an agreement tonight to uh, pay a visit yeah. to Olson's house and let our friends and neighbors on Sergeant Avenue know just how much we are with them. That's right. That so let's, right. Uh, we can get our things together. Uh, and then let's everyone meet up down at the, uh, the corner of the school playground at Cleveland and Sargent. And then we will march and we will sing our little hymn. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Our homes will still be white. Did you get that cross maybe talked about? Oh yeah. Rat, oiled, and ready to burn. It's in the back of my truck right now. Great. Now bring it over to the house, but keep it out of sight until we need it. And don't let Oscar see it. He might go soft on us. You bet. It's up to us to make sure that nigger gets the message. Keep rolling white. Keep rolling white. Keep rolling white. trying to sell your home to a, a colored couple, a Bill and Millie Francis, is that right? Here. Stop that. Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Francis have agreed to buy my home with a little help from some lady down south. Why do they they need I think a relative of Mrs. Mrs. Francis. Well, we're not at all happy about that. No, no we're not. not. I'm sure your Sergeant Avenue neighbors all feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know about that. Well, who who are these people? We're your neighbors. neighbors. What's your concern about my house? It's our what? neighborhood. George, we're with the Groveland Park Improvement Association. We're your neighbors all up and down the blocks around here. Mm -hmm. But I have a petition signed by about 300 yeah. people yeah. saying yeah. that no yeah. colors yeah. should live in Groveland Park. George. We, the homeowning residents, of the Groveland Park neighborhood. That's us. In the interest of maintaining the safety of our streets and preserving That's the value of our That's reasonable. Yeah. That's reasonable. Yeah. To strenuously oppose the purchase of any home Strenuous. in our neighborhood yep. or the occupancy of any such home mm -hmm. by here. persons of the colored race. They don't want right. yeah. they ever stop. That's the first I've heard of that. <laughs> well, what do you That's think of that, Olson? Yeah, I certainly didn't think I was breaking any law. Well, I don't know about any law, George, but this is more about being a good neighbor. That's, yeah. right. That's right. That's right. As you can see, there's a lot of strong feeling about this in Groveland mm -hmm. Park. The coloreds have their neighborhoods, the whites have theirs, yes. and that's the way things should stay. Yes, yeah, they need to stay. I, I don't know what you want me to do about it. 
I've got an agreement to sell my home to Mr. and Mrs. Francis. Mr. Olson, we think you can get out of that agreement, especially if you help the Nig, yeah, I mean the <laughs> Francis's, understand just how unwelcome they'd be in this area. And we can help you with that, George. Yes, yeah. we can. Uh, yeah. I don't know about that. Mr. Francis is a lawyer, you know, and, and I understand he's some sort of big shot with the Republican Party. Yeah. All the yeah. colors are part of the Republican Party, George, so you shouldn't worry about that. Francis just needs to understand that no one wants him or any of his no, kind no. to live in this area, and that might even be dangerous for him if he were to try to make the move. Yeah, right. You can tell him that, can't mm -hmm. you, Mr. Olson? Yeah, just tell, tell him. him. Well, I, I suppose I could tell him about your group, Mr. Arneson, but I want to sell my home, and I've got an agreement to do so at a fair price. George, you're assuming there'll still be a home for you to sell. Yeah. Well, it, maybe it's time we let George here see that little religious symbol you prepared. Step oh. back, folks. Oh my god! Are you members of the clan? I'm calling the cops! Good God, Wally. I didn't know you had one of those things ready. You're really pushing our luck now. Calm down, Oscar. The Francis need to know that we're serious. And once they hear about the cross here, I'm pretty sure that our problems are over. Over or, or just beginning? Let's get the hell out of here. Wait. In the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water, God's gonna trouble the water. passionate opposition to integration in St. Paul was far from an isolated incident. From the very beginning of the great migration of black citizens from the south to the industrial cities of the north, northern cities like St. Paul and Minneapolis often engaged in determined efforts accompanied by violence to preserve the residential segregation of the races. The Twin Cities themselves were home to some of the 51 chapters of the Ku Klux Klan in Minnesota. Burning crosses were the calling cards of these hate-inspired mobs. Go down, Moses, way down, down in Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. You better go down, go down, October 1924 cross burning at 2092 Sergeant Avenue was followed just days later by gunfire through a window of a nearby barber shop. The bullet passing between the Negro barber and his customer. Both events were reported in St. Paul newspapers as were other national events. 
St. Paul Mayor Arthur E. Nelson dreaded the impact of such publicity upon his office and his reputation, hoping for peace and ever the politician, Mayor Nelson called together the opposing parties for a meeting in his office on November 10. Mayor Nelson, Commissioner Clancy and Sheriff Wagner are here to see you. Well, thank you, Mary. Bring them all quite in, please. Yes. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Sheriff Wagner, Your Honor. Commissioner Clancy. How go things in law enforcement these days? Not too bad, Your Honor. I've got the county covered in. Jim here seems to have everything pretty well under control here in the city. Not quite everything, right, Jim? Uh, Your Honor? I want to know what the hell is going on over there in Groveland Park. Oh, you mean that cross burning over on Sargent Avenue at that home that the, uh, being purchased by the colored fella? That, and also that bullet being fired into the colored barber shop over on St. Clair Avenue. Where the hell are we, Birmingham, Alabama? Well, Your Honor, I don't think it's that big a deal, really. Um, there are just a few neighbors over in that neighborhood that don't want colored folks moving in the area. And, well, I, I think that's the only problem there. <clears throat> you uh, don't read the paper, evidently, Commissioner, oh. but I do. There have been a lot of problems with colored folks around town, uh, around the country recently including violence. Well, just last week, four people killed in Ohio in a battle with the Klan. And today, a labor riot at a, uh, at a uh, race riot at a uh, labor camp in Kentucky. We don't want those kinds of problems here in St. Paul. That's why I've asked you fellows to be here today. Judge Willis from the NAACP is going to be here in a few moments, and he's going to have with him this colored fellow that Arneson and his friends seem to think is such a problem. I've asked Arneson to be here, too. We're going to get this thing settled right here. Yes, Your Honor, I know the Klan has been busy over in the, uh, on the other side of the river, but we're trying to keep them over there. Well, by the way, do you fellas have any idea who this colored fella is that seems to be bothering uh, Arneson and his friends so much? Uh, I certainly don't. His name is Bill Francis. He's a lawyer in town, a, a good one. He went to the same law school I did, the St. Paul College of Law. And he has been very, very actively involved in the Republican Party, which, as you might recall, has recently won a couple of pretty good elections. Calvin Coolidge as the President of the United States and me for another term as your mayor. You understand my concern? We see your point, Your Honor. Mayor. Judge Willis is here with uh, Mr. Francis, and then a gentleman from the NAACP, Dr. Turner, and also there's another gentleman who says you asked him to be here, uh, Mr. Arneson. Fine. Show them right in, please, Mary. Judge Willis, very good to see you. Good to see you, Mayor. And Mr. Francis, it's always nice to see you, especially just one week after you helped to elect the President of the United States. Congratulations. Well, we miss seeing you over in district court, Mayor. You've always been a tough adversary. Well, as are you, Bill. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be back. This mayor's business is getting pretty hot for me. Your Honor, I assume you know that I am now President of the local chapter of the NAACP. And I'd like to introduce you to one of my fellow officers, Dr. Valdo Turner. That's Dr. Valdo Turner. He is a surgeon here in St. Paul. It's a great pleasure to meet you, Dr. Turner. My pleasure, Your Honor. I assume you gentlemen all know Mayor Wagner, Public oh, yeah. Safety Commissioner yes. Clancy. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, and you, sir, you must be Mr. Arneson. Well, that's correct, Your Honor. Uh, I think we met this summer at a Chamber of Commerce meeting. Uh, oh, yes, I remember that. Uh, Thanks for coming in, Mr. Arneson. Sure, sure. Well, Judge, you are the ones that asked for this little gathering here today. Why don't you tell us what seems to be the problem 
and how we can get it taken care of. Well, Mayor, we, and that, by that I mean the NAACP and Mr. Francis, who I assume for these proceedings is my client, we don't have too many problems with the fine city of St. Paul, except one major problem. It seems that Mr. Arneson and his neighbors over there in Groveland Park think it would be a travesty for the community if Mr. and Mrs. Francis were to move in. And they are doing their utmost, their absolute utmost to discourage them. They have burned a cross on the front yard of the property. They have staged a parade on Sargent Avenue. They've been singing, whooping, hollering, blowing horns, setting off fireworks. Uh, and then, then, they have been sending vicious, hateful notes to discourage Mr. and Mrs. Francis from moving into their property at 2092 Sargent. That's something you would expect in Mississippi, Mr. Mayor, not here in your city of St. Paul. Mr. Wait. Mayor. It's so bad that even that the Francis have not moved in as yet, they've had to hire private security in order to protect their property. Hold on right there, Judge. It wasn't me that brought that cross over to that house. And I don't know who might be sending messages to Mr. Francis, but I don't think it's any of the fine neighbors whom I have spoken with. Well, Arneson, I don't see you denying that the neighbors burned a cross in front of that property and that they've been sending vicious, hateful notes well, to Mr. and Mrs. Francis. That's just the problem with this situation, Your Honor. You just can't control what some people might do when they get so excited when someone is trying to change their world. Oh, we tried to explain that to Mr. Uh, Francis uh, when he started all this business a few months ago, but he wouldn't listen to us. Well, how about that, Bill? Did they try talking to you before these problems began? Well, they did, Your Honor. Mr. Arneson and two other members came to my office and told me that the neighborhood didn't want any colored residents because they thought that might affect their property values. And I told them I saw no reason for that to be true, and I assured them that Mrs. Francis and I would be excellent neighbors. As we told Mr. Francis, we have nothing against him personally. It's just that this is a white neighborhood and people will get scared off if colored folks start moving in. People are just frightened that all the money they put in their homes will be lost and they'll be stuck holding a home that no one wants. Except, of course, other colored people who can't afford the real cost of these homes. Your Honor, this is exactly, exactly what the NAACP has been fighting all across the country residential segregation. Not just down south, but up here in the great north as well. Why, it wasn't very long ago that we won a case in the United States Supreme Court which declared unconstitutional any city ordinance designed to enforce segregation. And now, right now, we are involved in another court battle seeking the same ruling against private covenants designed to preserve segregation by private agreement. I'm sorry to say, no I'm not. I'm not sorry to say, Mr. Arneson, you are about to find yourself on the losing side of history. Colored folks will not be restricted to living in the Rondo neighborhood forever. You might just want to get used to that <laughs> well, Mr. Arneson, what do you have to say to that? Groveland Park isn't the only white neighborhood in St. Paul, Your Honor. We told Mr. Francis that we would cover all his expenses, even help him find another house in another neighborhood if he would just try to get along with us. The builder of the home, a Mr. Olson, even offered to build another house for Mr. Francis. So I don't see why the NAACP needs to get so excited about changing our neighborhood when some people obviously have such strong feelings. Mr. Mayor, perhaps you're not aware of 
everything that's going on in this town. But this housing segregation that Arneson here loves so much is just a tip of a very ugly iceberg of racial prejudice here in St. Paul. Why, we still are not <laughs> welcome at the, the Eagle Bass down on uh, uh, Wilder Street or, or, or even a new downtown YMCA. Your Honor, our NAACP chapter has a lot of issues on its plate. Housing segregation is just one of them. Dr. Turner, it really disappoints me to hear that we have this kind of unhappiness in our city. We don't want trouble of this sort in St. Paul. And I am committed to maintaining the peace in the city, including the peace between the races. Isn't that right, Jim? Uh, you certainly are, Your Honor. And that's as is your, your police department. That's why we sent a squad over immediately when we heard about the cross burning. But when we got there, nobody was around, just a burned out cross. Well, as I said, we don't want trouble of this sort in St. Paul. <laughs> Not while I'm mayor of this city. Bill. I heard Arneson say just a minute ago that he and his pals would be willing to reimburse you for all the expenses that you've had and mm -hmm. also to find a, another house maybe that Olson could build for you in a different white neighborhood. Mm -hmm. well, how much does this all cost you? You know, the expense for uh, lining up financing and uh, paying those security guards, anything else there might have been. What's the total on all of that? Well, I'm out at least $1,000, which I would need very soon if we're to find another house. But Mayor. My wife and I like the house on Sargent, and that's where we want to live. Bill, I understand how you feel. And Dr. Turner, I truly respect what it is that NAACP is attempting to accomplish in putting a dent into this segregation city in St. Paul. But you know, it, it just seems to me that we could accomplish the same thing by having Bill buy, uh, own a home in a different white neighborhood of St. Paul. And that way, maybe we could avoid the violence that they've had in Ohio and in Kentucky. We don't want a riot in St. Paul. And we don't want the Ku Klux Klan. Bill, you understand that. Well, of course I understand that. Honestly, how long would it take you and your friends to get the money together to reimburse Bill and maybe to find Olson to build another house for him in a different white neighborhood? Oh, we can have the money by tomorrow, Your Honor. And we can make it right with Mr. Francis within a few days. If this is going to happen, we don't have much time. Mrs. Francis and I are moving out of our home on St. Anthony this coming Friday, so we would need the money in hand before then. But as I said, we really don't want to miss out on that house on Sargent. I'll have to speak with my wife about this. Sounds to me like we have a deal in the making here. The one that could satisfy everybody, right, Arneson? Oh, absolutely, Your Honor. And we've seen the last of the cross burnings, the last of the demonstrations, and the last of the threats, right, Arneson? Oh, you have my word on that, Mr. Mayor. Bill, I'd like you to speak to your wife about this. Now, surely she's a reasonable person. She doesn't want violence in this city any more than you or I. Would you do that? I'll see what she says, Mayor. Thanks, Bill. Well, Judge Willis, Dr. Turner, Mr. Arneson, I think we've come up to, with a solution to our little problem here today, and one that won't require any more police protection either. I want to thank all of you for coming in and talking through the situation, arriving at a solution. And believe me, I will truly appreciate anything you can do to help maintain the peace of this city. Dr. Turner. I'm home. Billy, honey, is that you? Oh, hi, honey. I fixed chicken and dumplings for dinner. But the dumplings are giving me a bit of a problem. Hi, sweetheart. So, 
why don't you pour yourself a drink and when it's done, I'll, honey, what's wrong? Billy, how'd your meeting go with the mayor today? <laughs> Certainly not the way I anticipated it. Certainly not with Valdo and Judge Willis and company. You know, I thought we presented a pretty formidable group. <laughs> what happened, Billy? What they say, what they do? Well, the mayor was there with Commissioner Clancy and Sheriff Wagner. Arneson showed up too. Arneson? <laughs> That's curious. What did he need to be there for? You know, I was surprised by that too. The mayor must have invited him so that all could hear his, the association's view, as if the papers haven't already written enough about that opinion. <laughs> They're the problem. What solution could they possibly offer? Interesting you should ask that. I don't understand, Billy. What did Arneson have to say? Well, Judge Willis presented our side of the issue to the association. He described the demonstrations and the threatening notes and the cross burnings. He also made them aware of the expenses we've incurred due to our hiring of private security. <laughs> I hope the mayor didn't try to act surprised about the cross burnings. Everybody knew about that. Well, before he could respond, Armisen was all over himself, disclaiming any involvement in the cross burnings on the part of the association or himself, which I found curious. He transferred blame to, in his own words, other people whom they have no control over. Well, what did the sheriff and the commissioner have to offer? Well, actually, they were quite silent through the whole meeting. Why am I not surprised? I surmised they were trying to size up which way the wind was blowing. You know, I described to the mayor how Mr. Arneson and a couple other members presented their concerns at the prospect of lower property values due to the presence of Negroes in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Then I told him how we would be excellent neighbors. Valdo joined in and assured them that by allowing our move would be an excellent demonstration of social advancement in St. Paul. I am so glad Valdo was there. Well, our little argument didn't work. <sighs> That's ridiculous. With all that we've done in St. Paul, why Arneson should be aware of what we've done politically if only for his position in the legislature. Well, apparently he hasn't spoken up to the association so far, even though he's one of their leaders. <laughs> George Olson sold us the house, and he's white. Mm. He didn't have a problem with it, neither should they. What is it, Billy? Why are you so quiet? They came up with another solution. They suggested reimbursing us the money we're out in order for us to find another house in another neighborhood. Or have Olsen build us a home somewhere else. That's well, ridiculous. Well, Arneson said he can have the money by tomorrow. And I told him that you and I would discuss it. No. Was Arneson threatening? No, he wasn't threatening at all. Arneson seemed to be attempting to cajole me more than anything. I guess for the mayor's benefit. That's ridiculous. Look, it might be the easier way out of all this, Nelly. Ernie Starks has been sitting notes. He's had a brick thrown through his shop window and he's been shot at as well. And he sounds like he's thinking of moving out. Oh, no. Now look, sweetheart, they are willing to subsidize our move. We can buy a new home in another neighborhood with fewer problems. Ridiculous. I worry so much less about you when I'm out of town. I don't want you hurt because of all this. No, no, no. Ellie. No, no, no. Billy, honey, we have given our lives to this community, to this city, to this state. Nobody has a right to decide where we get to move. I don't care about their threats. We have a right to move into that neighborhood and live in that house. Well, I advised the group that we're moving out this Friday, so we would need the money by then. And I told them that you and I would discuss their proposal. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, the open minds closed as soon as they found out we'd be moving into that neighborhood. So close that they are willing 
to give us money to stay away? Oh, well, I'm glad to see your danders up. It's what brought me back to what we're about. So, we're agreed then? Oh, my <laughs> yes. We are agreed. We are moving into that house. And Arneson and his friends won't stop us. See, that's why I love you, sweetheart. Smart and stubborn <laughs> and brave. <laughs> Pretty, too. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, this is going to be a learning experience for Arneson and his association. Hear, hear? Hear, hear. Come on, sweetheart. Let's go eat some chicken and dumplings. It's Aunt Frankie's recipe. Aunt Frankie? So good. Ooh, yes. Natalie, come on here. On November 14th, 1924, six days after the meeting in Mayor Nelson's office, Billy and Nellie Francis moved into their new home. During the ensuing weeks, they continued to receive ugly threats of violence. And during the same time, a rock was thrown into the window of the barber shop on St. Clair Avenue. Notwithstanding this tempest, on December 5th, the Francis's prepared for a quiet evening in their new home. Sorry I'm so late, honey. Billy oh. Francis, you scared me half to death. I thought maybe you got lost on your way out to this part of town. Well, funny you should bring that up. You know, that St. Clair streetcar driver gave me a strange look when I climbed on. And at about Snelling, this white lady asked if I was lost coming to this part of town. She said, no coloreds live out here. And I told her, well, we do now. <laughs> Chauffeur. Well, <laughs> that lady should have told you that if you get home late after 8 o'clock, oh. your supper's going to be cold. I'm so sorry, honey. I got caught up in that criminal court trial starting next week, and I guess I just lost track of the time. It won't happen again, I promise. But I do have to allow myself more time on that streetcar. You know, our old neighborhood was a lot closer to town than this Groveman Park area. Yes, <laughs> you're right about that. Mm. But Billy, it's real nice here, isn't it? I mean, it's so nice. I think we're just gonna be so happy here. Another cross? Another cross, please. Oh, mercy, no, no. Oh, no. Billy, I was on my way over to talk to you about the bank, but I saw him, Billy. I saw him right out in front of the house, them and that cross. Baldo. Can you believe it? Did you see who they were? No, too dark. And they ran when they saw me. That's the way cowards do things. Nellie's calling the police. Baldo, I thought that after we met with the mayor, we'd be through with this business. I mean, sure, we've had private security driving around, but I really haven't thought it would come to this. Wake up, Billy. You know how the Klan operates, and it ain't just down south. You and Nellie are busting up a pretty segregated town here, you know. Those crackers won't give up without a fight. Well, we won't quit either. You know that, Baldo. Yes, I do. That's why first thing in the morning, I'm going to call the national office and tell them that we need to provide protection for you around the clock. You deserve it, Billy, after all you've done for our people. You know, that'd be great, Baldo. But it's not really me I'm worried about. Nellie is here alone all day, and these guys? Well, they seem pretty crazy. They sent, they sent her a postcard. Put a beggar on horseback and he will ride it to death. Mm. Billy, honey, the police are en route and Commissioner Clancy is at the door. <laughs> Baldo, nice to mm. see you. You picked a fine time to visit our home. I was on my way over to talk to Billy about the bank, and I saw the coward stick off down the street. Well, Commissioner Clancy, welcome to our Friday night cross burning party. I am so sorry, Mr. Francis. This is just terrible. I, I was just driving down Cleveland, saw the 
flames and came right over. Well, I'm afraid you're too late. Dr. Turner here saw our friendly clansmen riding off just as he was arriving. My boys are supposed to be keeping a special eye out for trouble in this area. Obviously, they missed this one. I promise you we will do better. The mayor doesn't want this kind of trouble in the city, and neither do I. Billy, about the banquet. I know it's just a, a few nights off, but with everything that's going on, maybe we'd do best to postpone it. Uh, what kind of banquet are we talking about? Well, Commissioner, you may not know it, but Mr. Billy Francis here is the chair of the color division of the Republican National Committee, which, as you may recall, was instrumental in getting President Calvin Coolidge reelected. So on Monday night down at Pioneer Hall, a very large number of our colored community will be gathering just to pay honor to Mr. Billy Francis. So a large delegation of your people are gathering in St. Paul in just a couple of days specifically for the benefit of Mr. Francis. Well, I guess that's one way you could put it. Don't you think that's dangerous, Dr. Turner? Uh, Mr. Francis? I mean, when those people hear about what happened here tonight, there's no telling how they might react. The mayor, all of us down at City Hall don't want to see violence in this city. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, it's not the colored folks who are burning crosses and raising hell in this town. It, it's really, you want to stop serious trouble, you and the mayor need to talk to some other folks. Mm. But Billy, it's, it's you I'm concerned about. You know, with everything that's going on, all of this stuff is, that's happening, and Nelly, the postcards, maybe we should postpone it for a month, maybe two. Ah, oh, Mr. Francis, now that sounds like a good idea. Sorry, gentlemen, but we're doing this. In fact, I've already got my speech ready, and I think it's a good one. I deal with a lot, but here's a line I think you'll find interesting. First. I'll reference the problem of racial segregation in St. Paul, particularly how it has recently affected Nellie and me. Then I'll say these words. Have faith in me. I will not falter nor betray thee, even if that means I have to pay the supreme sacrifice. You know, I think I'll change that. To have faith in us, since Nellie will always be right here with you. Yes, I will. That is a noble statement, Bill, but could you please leave that sentence out? I'm just really concerned about people getting riled up. Sorry, Commissioner. I'm afraid I can't do that. And even if I wanted to, Nellie wouldn't let me. Would you, darling? I love you, Billy. And I love you. <laughs> well, please, please do whatever you can to try to avoid trouble. I'm going to talk to the mayor about this first thing Monday morning. Following that second cross burning at 2092 Sargent Avenue, Dr. Valdo Turner and other members of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People stood guard at the home. Assuming the risk of personal harm or death as its members have throughout the long and arduous struggle for equal rights. Uh, Dr. Turner and Nellie Francis were founding members of the St. Paul chapter of the NAACP and among its early leaders, preceding the emergence of St. Paul of Roy Wilkins, the NAACP president and foremost national civil rights leader of his day. Local public officials in St. Paul, as elsewhere in the country, often were brought to action only by the perseverance and the efforts of the NAACP. Jim, have you made any arrests yet on that latest cross burning over in Groveland Park? No, Mayor. It's a difficult situation. And, well, there's going to be a gathering 
of a large gathering of coloreds to honor Mr. Francis for his work during the election in just a, a couple of days, tonight. Well, uh, and through these cross burners, do they generally operate in open space? Of course not, Your Honor. Uh, these things don't happen in broad daylight, and the cross burners seldom stick around to watch their handiwork. Well, what so I do know, Jim, is this. If we don't get this thing under control right now, neither you nor I are going to be able to keep these nice jobs that we've had for very long. And I don't know about you, but I rather enjoy having people stand up when I enter the room. It's, as I say, Your Honor, it's a bad situation. And Mr. Francis is, well, a large group of coloreds are gathering to honor Mr. Francis for his work in the election. And he's going to tell him about the cross burning on Friday night and his intent to fight. Oh, that's just terrific. This could get very ugly very quickly. That's what I'm concerned about. Mayor Nelson, Mr. Arneson is here. Send him right in. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honor. Your Honor, it's Arneson. I thought we had a deal. I'm not sure I know what you're talking about, Mr. Mayor. Well, maybe this article in today's Daily News will refresh your memory a little bit. The one about the fiery cross burning on Friday night in Bill Francis's front yard. <sighs> the cross was the second to be burned near the Francis home. And according to Oscar Arneson of the Groveland Park Improvement Association, the Ku Klux Klan never burns more than two of these warning crosses. The matter will now be left to the community to settle as it sees fit, Mr. Arneson said last night following a meeting of the citizens group. That's what I'm talking about, Arneson. But your honor, it was Francis who broke the deal. We were still trying to get the money together when, when he went ahead and moved into that house. Uh, Mayor, Bill Francis told me that Arneson came to see him prior to the deadline, but he had no money, just more promises and more threats. Mr. Mayor. Arneson! As far as I'm concerned, you and your pals are this close to starting a riot. And there will be hell for you to pay if that happens, believe me. Let me read you a telegram that I received just yesterday from the National Office of the NAACP. National Association for Advancement of Colored People has been authoritatively advised that demonstrations extending over a period of more than two months have been made against reputable colored citizens because they bought property in neighborhoods to which purchases by certain individuals are opposed. Among those, according to newspapers and other reports, are W.T. Francis, colored attorney who purchased property at 2092 Sargent, and Ernest Starks, 2028 St. Clair. We are reliably informed that the situation is very tense and that there is the possibility of serious trouble and even violence if authorities do not act promptly to stamp out such lawlessness. We call upon you to take such steps immediately as will protect these citizens in their constitutional rights and to apprehend and punish to the full extent of the law those who are responsible for the threats and acts of violence signed by James Weldon, an officer of the National Association in New York City. Arneson, are you starting to see what you're up against? What about the white people, Your Honor? Don't, <laughs> you seem to be forgetting about the 300 people. That's 300 voters, Your Honor, who signed our petition to keep the colored folks out of Groveland Park. Don't we have any rights? All we want is for people to be able to live where they can be most comfortable and not be afraid of their neighbors. Uh, colored folks want the same thing. That, that's why they all live down in that Rondo neighborhood. All this may be true, Oscar. But there is no law that says that a colored man cannot own a home on Sargent Avenue. But we do have laws that say that citizens cannot be threatened, that homes cannot be burned, and that riots cannot be incited. 
And trust me, we intend to enforce those laws very vigorously, don't we, Jim? We certainly do. That's why we've got police patrolling that area on a regular basis now. Are there other uh, things you, uh, any other uh, telegram did you see? Did you see the one that uh, Mayor or that uh, Sheriff Wagner sent out this morning? I have that, Your Honor. May I read it? Yes. Your telegram of this date was received and contents noted as Sheriff of Ramsey County will fully and fiercely enforce the laws of the state to protect its citizens to the fullest extent from any violence, demonstrations, or lawlessness of any kind. And I've also got your uh, telegram, too, if you'd like me to read that, Mayor. No, I think that's OK. I think that Arneson is starting to get the picture here. Oscar, you don't want a riot in this city any more than Commissioner, than Commissioner Clancy or I want a riot. The fact of the matter is, if there is one, I would bet that one of the very first buildings to burn to the ground would be your nice printing business. And there wouldn't be much we could do to prevent that from happening. I'm just one man, Mr. Mayor. I can't guarantee anything. Oh, I think you can, Oscar, if you try hard enough. The newspapers are clearly listening to you, and I think your neighbors will, too. I'll try. Let me tell you something that might be helpful. As you know, Bill Francis has been very, very active in the Republican Party. I happen to know that the Coolidge Campaign Committee is very appreciative of the good work that Bill did in the recent election. It won't surprise me one little bit. If Bill gets offered a nice position in the federal government soon, maybe in Washington, D.C., maybe even in the Foreign Service, he had his hat in the ring for one of those positions the last time the Republicans were in charge. So you can tell your neighbors that the Francis's may well not be living down in that Groveland Park neighborhood for all that long. That might cool them down a little bit. That is uh, useful information, Your Honor. As I said, I will do what I can. Well, I know you will. I know you will, Oscar. But we will be keeping our eye on you. Isn't that right, Jim? We certainly will, Your Honor. And we don't want to see any more stories in the local newspapers about problems in Groveland Park. Do you understand me? Yes, I do. Thanks for coming in. Jim, I want to keep that house on, on Sergeant protected 24 hours a day, at least until the end of December. Got it? Got it, Mayor. And I think that ought to do it. We don't have a lot of street crime in January, not in St. Paul. Yes, Nellie, that certainly was quite the fight and all over one house. Just one colored family moving into an all-white neighborhood. Yes, Valdo, that was a scary time. I mean, I don't know if we could have stuck it out if it hadn't have been for the NAACP brothers standing guard for one month and the city police doing their part. Thank you, Jesus, we didn't have to do it entirely alone. I mean, uh, after Mayor and, and Commissioner Clancy uh, gave Arneson, laid down the law for Arneson and his cronies, things quieted down rather quickly. Now don't forget, Baldo, as bad as those neighbors misbehaved, some of the local colleges and some of the white ministers of churches in that area, they came to Nellie and uh, Billy's uh, defense. <laughs> that help didn't come soon enough for Ernie Starks and his barbershop over on St. Clair. I mean, a brick through his window and bullet shots coming through the shop? Oh, caused him to close up. That was hard. Yeah, now Nellie, we, we really can't blame old Ernest. I mean, the bullet passed right between him and his customer while he was cutting the man's hair. Yeah. Not too many people would stick around and give a gunman a second chance. You're right about that, Valdo. I mean, I don't blame him for pulling out at all. 
but you'd have thought by us merely buying that house that we were starting a revolution. Well, you were starting a revolution, darling. That's just what you were trying to do, wasn't it? That's You're what right you about said. that, Mrs. Pierce. They were starting a revolution, but that revolution has a long road in front of it, mm -hmm. especially given that 1926 decision mm -hmm. by the United States Supreme Court. Now, what decision was that, Judge? Well, that would involve the case that we, the NAACP, brought in Washington, D.C. We wanted to have these restricted covenants that are designed to protect lily white neighborhoods uh, unlawful. Well, since that decision, those covenants have spread like wildfires, mm -hmm. particularly in Minneapolis, but there are some right here in St. Paul. Um, they have the same thing in Nashville. We didn't know what to do. Oh, it was horrible. Just terrible. <sighs> yes, it was. I, I, I don't know, Auntie, if, if I can help you. Oh, Nellie, you're still a young woman. <laughs> Auntie, I am just, I'm so tired. I, I'm tired with all the fighting with all the white folk here in St. Paul and all the fighting over in Liberia where Billy was ambassador. I am just, I'm so tired. You know, Nellie, I think maybe it's time for me to read to you a speech that a hopeful young woman wrote for her 1891 graduation from St. Paul Central High School. Her mama sent it along with me from Nashville. Mrs. Pierce, I think that she should wait. I think that, that you should just take it easy on our, our young sister here. It's She's been through enough, enough, without dragging her into yet another fight. I, I just think you should be patient with her. Yes, she may appear to be a spring chicken, at least in our eyes. Mm -hmm. But Nellie's been through an awful lot, and she's done an yes, awful lot. An awful lot for our community. Why, uh, it was Nellie that got the women the vote. And she also got that anti-lynching bill passed up there at the legislature. But most importantly, she's one of the founders of our local NAACP chapter. Yes, Valdo, I did those things. But has anything really changed? I mean, in some ways, I feel more like a foreigner right here at home in St. Paul than I did over there where Billy was ambassador. I, I'm just so... I'm so discouraged. Oh, dear. I think I'd, I'd like to read to you oh, a speech auntie. that a hopeful young woman wrote. You just want to go and embarrass me? No, no, no. no, no but I, I think I, I'd like to hear this myself. Yes. 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 Here it is. St. Paul Pioneer Press, June 12, 1891. No speaker in the evening was more enthusiastically received than Nellie Griswold. Mm -hmm. She spoke on the race problem. Miss Griswold possesses an attractive and intellectual face and a petite figure. <laughs> My, now that does sound like a young Nellie. Mm -hmm. She reviewed briefly the former condition of the black man which made him less favored in his surroundings than the domestic animals on his master's plantation. She could not see where the American derived that feeling of superiority, which prompts him to refuse the Negro that panoply of citizenship equal to his own. She ended with these words. In light of these facts, it cannot be denied that should the Negroes be given the same rights and privileges as other people, and given the same opportunities, there is no cause for apprehension as to the solution of the race problem. Amen, sister. Amen. There's more. May the people of this country, north and south, east and west, early awake to the sense of their duty in this matter and thoroughly recognize that the race problem must be settled right. And then will the rays of the early morning sun kiss the fair land of a happy, peace-loving, 
justice doing people and then can all, black and white, American and foreign born, shout with one glad <laughs> shout that shall sound and resound yes. from pole to pole and from sunrise to sunset. This is the land of the free. Here, here, here. Yeah, hooray for our knowledge. Yes, yes. 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 My, now that was quite a speech. Nellie, I, I, I just, I'm sorry, but I think I have to agree with your auntie. That did not sound to me like a girl who would ever, ever run from a good fight. Mm. Pastor Harris, I was, I was just a young girl when I wrote that back then. Why, I just met Billy. God knows I love that man. I still, I still love him. But you know, Billy, he always told me there was nothing I could not get done if I just set my mind to it. So, I guess I'm just going to have to set my mind once more. Auntie, you'll help me with that, right? Oh, you know I will, darling. <laughs> and now I think maybe it's time for us to pack up for our ride down south. We can't keep Billy waiting at the depot. As usual, you're right again. Mm. Well, now it's about time I, I left myself, so we'll see you. Pastor Harris, thank you so much for everything. Please, please do keep us in your prayers. You know I will, darling, and Mrs. Harris also. Oh, Valdo, Judge, you two have been such good, good, good friends. You. You guys, do you keep that fight up, oh, you hear? We will, we will, we will. Following her return to Nashville, Nellie Francis lived another 40 years until 1969. Little was known of her history during that time other than her employment during her 70s and 80s as a secretary at Tennessee A&I University. We can only imagine what good and courageous work she and other unsung heroes of the Civil Rights Movement must have accomplished during those years. Nellie now lies beside William Francis at Greenwood Cemetery the traditional African-American burial ground in Nashville. Oh, and as uh, for the uh, architect of segregation, Oscar Arneson, his unholy work came to an end in uh, 1926, brought to an end by a bad heart. We now hope for good <coughs> hearts for all. May the people of this country North and South, East and West, early awake to their duty in this matter and thoroughly recognize that the race problem must be settled right. And then will the rays of the early morning sun kiss the fair land of a happy, peace-loving, justice-doing people. And then can all, black and white, American and foreign-born, shout with one glad shout that shall sound and resound from pole to pole, and from sunrise to sunset, this is the land of the free. You gotta move, you gotta move, you gotta move, child, you gotta move. 